hospital. Okay, so let's start with your impressions. What stands out to you? What makes you say yes or what or I wonder? There's a lot there. Yeah. Art? Yeah, I would say it's inspirational. Right? You know, mm. It sounds to me that regardless, things will be well. Mm. Yeah, that does feel like that's a good summary of it. All, all will be well. Yeah. What else stands out to you? What do you notice? <clears throat> well, it's the life of Jesus, it's life and physical, seems kind of important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, more important. I, mean, I don't think of this text as being one of the ones that makes that point. Mm. It makes that point. It does. Yeah. Yeah. If in your body, if that in your body, if that's what you're doing, yeah. That is, yeah. Mm, it might be. Someone here probably knows more than I do. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get down there. Anything else stand out to you? Yes. Okay. Well, then let's jump into it. So I'm on, I'm on the back of the handout, page fourteen. Number one, top of the page, uh, this quote <coughs> by um, Judith Judith Deal, whose commentary is is the one the dominant one really that I'm using in this series. The treasure is the gospel message of redemption and reconciliation through Jesus Christ. It is a singular noun indicating that the treasure is one particular thing that is of great worth and value. The precious, glorious gospel exists in contrast to the knowledge or wisdom of the world that the Corinthians thought was so important before they came to believe in Christ, 1 Corinthians 1. Paul's use of the word treasure reminds us of a parable taught by Jesus. So Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So there's this initial um, image of treasures in jars of clay. So let's focus first on treasure, treasure. Uh, the suggestion here that the treasure is is the gospel message, the, the message about Jesus, the parable, as Jesus tells it, the treasure is the, the kingdom of heaven. Um, how often do you think of Jesus or, or the good news as treasure and why or why not let's just kind of talk about that that image yeah the, um, not as often as i'm sure mm. but last night uh, Debbie and i tried to watch the one from wall street oh i don't know how many of you can watch that but it is one sick show and you, I mean, we gave up an hour because we discussed it. Yeah. But it also made me think, wow, you, you know, this culture needs what Jesus prays mm. because this is what happens when things go completely so. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I think, yeah, Jesus is treasure compared to this. Right. Yeah. It's a. Uh... Yeah. It's a tough, tough illustration of, of a different, the search for a different treasure, really. Yeah. What else? How, how often do you think of Jesus or the message of Jesus or the kingdom of heaven as a treasure? Okay. I don't think well, that's an image I go for. No. I mean, it, yeah. without thinking about it now, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not a 
treasure hunter, treasure seeker, mm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we should think of it as a lottery win or something. <laughs> mm. Yeah, <laughs> maybe needs a, a, a dynamic equivalent. Yeah, yeah, modern equivalent of everybody searching for something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it could be a worldview that we're just not used to. Treasure, yeah. What were you gonna say, Art? No, I was gonna just say, you know, like Dale, it's yeah, typical. So they take it for granted. I'm mm. probably too complacent about it. And you know, of course, God loves me, and of course, God sent Jesus to uh, save me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you know, maybe one thing this text would do just prompt you to think a little bit more about about that whether we use a, a modern equivalent to it or, or stick with the word treasure. Right. Yeah. What occurs to me is that treasure doesn't know that it's treasure. Mm. And uh, I, I think we are living as treasures without recognizing mm. that. Yeah. The treasure yeah. itself doesn't know. It's yeah. Yeah. Mm. Especially because it's, it's hidden in these clay jars, right? It's wrapped <laughs> up in these, these clay jars. So let's let's talk about the clay jars here. Um, so number three on page fourteen of the handout, treasure and jars of clay were familiar images in the Greco Corinthian Greco Roman Corinthian culture. In addition, these pictures were familiar to the readers of the Old Testament. In the first century A.D., items of great value were often kept in clay jars, simply because such jars were so unobtrusive and inconspicuous, they attracted no attention by their outward appearance. But it wasn't unusual for people to wrap a valuable treasure in a piece of old cloth and bury it in a secret place, since there were no banks for safety deposit boxes in those days. Clay jars or earthenware vessels, depending on how you would translate that, were not just common, they were very common. Hundreds of years after they were deemed useless, countless shards, pieces, whole items of pottery had been discovered in archaeological digs all over the Middle East. Uh, so it's a little counterintuitive, right, to, to uh, back then to place something valuable in something that looks so um, worthless, This just a normal clay jar. Uh, so so number four there, what do we do with our treasures? I mean, how do we s store or, I mean, when, when we have something really valuable, where does it go? How, how is it displayed? What, what's that? Safety deposit boxes. Safety deposit boxes, right? <laughs> Hidden away, locked in a bank vault. What were you going to say, Art? I was going to say stuff like, you know, behind both glass. And, right. You know, <laughs> and scenes, and yeah. Works of art and, you know, security and surveillance and, you know, just trying to keep the treasure. Mm -hmm. the yeah. So even, even if it's visible, say, uh, you know, Picasso at the Met, it, first they built this enormous beautiful structure for it right and then they've got guards everywhere and alarms and cameras and probably sensors i, I guess i've not tried it but <laughs> i assume there are yeah yeah uh, but in some ways we do the same if you're hiding something in your house so you're going to go on vacation you want something you know to be hidden so that somebody broke in they wouldn't find it easily mm -hmm. um you do hide it in something that's plain and easy and mm. you know that, that somebody would overlook that mm. wouldn't you don't go hide it in your special drawers or whatever you mm. put it in some place mm. that you think yeah refrigerator so, freezer refrigerator, freezers <laughs> or someplace that you you think people yeah. won't look you, you try to hide it in ordinary place. yeah it makes me think of those those little safes that look like you right. know like a can of shaving gel that's right yeah something yeah. like that that's the first place i'm going Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's 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 think a little bit more about ourselves as jars of clay. Number five in the Greco-Roman culture, the physical body was frequently described as a container or vessel for the mind or soul of the person. Such a vessel wears out, grows old, dies, and is dissolved, thus appearing to be inferior, like an earthenware pot. It's remarkable that God chose to put the treasure of his gospel message in the hearts of fallible, cracked, chipped, fragile human beings. You know, perhaps an allusion back to this text in Jeremiah 18. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel, the vessel or clay jar, 
he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel or clay jar that seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Says the Lord, just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So let's let's think about ourselves as, as clay jars, as earthenware vessels, as the, the work of a potter here. Um, how would you finish this sentence? Seeing myself as a clay jar makes sense to me because I, what, what is there about your experience in life that makes you feel like, yeah, that, that feels like I'm a little bit of a clay jar. I'm cracked. I'm cracked. Okay. Ordinary. Ordinary. Art? I think about the, the potter's hand, and I, and I think that, you know, we're created and we're, you know, the products of, you know, I might even say our environment from our environment mm. and how we, you know, how others interact with us. And so we're always being shaped. And, and so when I think of that, that's that's the way I would describe it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Robert? I like that song says, you are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and shape me. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah Imperfect, like but useful. Being molded and shaped by God. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, Damus, did you say imperfect? Oh, that was Gail. Oh, sorry, Guy. Yes, imperfect, yet useful. Imperfect, yet useful. That's nice. I say, say important and fragile. Important and fragile. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I like that duality of being both things. It's like clay mm. jars are both this very um, inconspicuous thing to house treasure and what would be unexpected. Uh, but yet they're, the, the thing that they are holding is important. Mm -hmm. so if you think about like, the gift of the spirit in Barack Obama's like house, yeah. it's very... It's a very moving image for yeah. thinking of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And the nice thing is that everybody's a clay jar, right? It's not like, mm -hmm. oh man, I'm I'm a clay jar and look at all these uh yeah. Yeah. works of art around me. I mean we're we're all clay jars. Right. Anything else about your your existence as a human, your daily life that makes you resonate with that image of clay jar? I think it's easy to be judged, you know, negatively by by others because of your your clay jarness, mm -hmm. dismissed or minimized in some way. Okay, uh, number eight at the bottom of the page. Paul goes on to say that God wants to demonstrate His power in contrast to the power of human beings. Paul recognizes the total insufficiency of human instruments, but he also acknowledges God's total sufficiency to achieve his purposes through his servants. Paul's very aware of the irony. It is unusual and remarkable <coughs> that a committed Jew, a persecuted Christians in Jerusalem would be chosen as the instrument by which the gospel message of Jesus Christ would be conveyed to the Gentiles. Um, can you think of some ways in which you've seen this to be true so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us because that's that's what paul says here that god's placed this treasure the message of jesus jesus the spirit the kingdom of god has placed that in us jars of clay why so that it may be made made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to god and doesn't come from us how, how have you experienced the truth of that Right. And one of the things that I would say with regards to play jars is that they have capacity, and so we have capacity. And and if anything good that comes out of that clay jar is it, really instinctive, which means it doesn't really come from you, mm. so it comes from God. Okay. Yeah. So any any true act, of, 
which is a good act, is not your act. Hmm. It's God working through you. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that I hear you leaning into is the limitations that come with being a clay jar make it all the more remarkable when we think of what God does through through that clay jar. That those things are God's work in us. Oh, yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. yeah. Good. What else about your own experience, uh, Eva and then Julie? Before I became a Christian, I grew up in the Catholic Church. And my belief was, and it was not, I still remember this, even though it was like over 20 years ago. Whenever I succeed in something, it was my doing, mm. my greatness, my wisdom. Whenever things were going bad, bad or bad, God, God is not, oh, here, yeah. He's yeah. not doing this for me. And yeah. Gratefully and really thankfully, I God found me and say, "Okay, mm. here you are. I'm gonna put you on this right path." And I am not the poster child for Christianity here, but every time I remember that whatever happened in my life is God's will, mm. and that especially something good, I consciously give him the face for it. <clears throat> and and that makes such a big difference in my own life, mm. you know. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Simple thing, you mm -hmm. know, being kind to people. Mm. Sometimes, you know, people rap, rap on me their own way, really. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Quite often I like I, I love you. I am indifferent to most of them, you know. Mm -hmm. But if I open my heart and remember God, mm. then I include everybody. Mm. Right? Yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah. In the culture. That's really beautiful. That's my... Thank you. Yeah. And we'll come back to you. I mean, I appreciate you bringing up the, you know, when bad things happen, because really the rest of the text is is going into that direction. Oh. So, uh, Julie? I'm going to say I'm a guy that I needed um, some, some of the work I'm hanging in. Whatever you say, thank you for that, or whatever you say to yourself. I mean, it was... It was oh, really? Of, yeah. You know, so good thing to say. I think, hmm. you know, I always say thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But there is something good about that. Yeah, you can see what he was trying to do there. Just yeah, acknowledge that this is part of the way that God's working through my clay jar. Yeah, and I, I can I can appreciate that. Um, let's. Oh, okay. Last last comment here, and then we'll go on. Try to make it short. I can see very clearly all the times I've tried to do something or kind of not not talk to God about it, not try to find his path, but just do my own thing, how that and usually always a failure. Mm. And um, it's only when I I study and pray and actively see what God wants that things kind of, well, almost magically, but because of faith and because of what I'm seeking, mm. things really start to go right. Mm. And yeah. I know it's not me. I can mess it up better than anybody else sometimes. Does, so. mm. <laughs> mm. I appreciate that. That, that. Yeah, I think that testimony resonates with a lot of us. Um, let's jump into the next section here uh, where we have these, these four pairs of contrasts uh, because essentially what, what Paul's doing now is uh, digging into what it feels like to be a clay jar that's filled with this treasure from his own experience here. So number 10 on page 15, Paul admits that in their human fallibility and insufficiency, it was not easy for him and his fellow missionaries to carry the gospel into Gentile territory. However, their trials confirmed to the reader that Paul was able to accomplish what God asked him to do. Paul uses a familiar literary strategy called Catalog of Hardships in verses 8 and 9 to demonstrate his hardships and afflictions. This literary strategy is repeated again in the letter, multiple places, and in uh, other Pauline letters as well. 
The list is composed of four balanced antitheses, all written grammatically as participles. The first word of each pair of words states a human weakness. So like the, the first word in each pair is sort of like the, the clay jarness. And the second word following the but not illustrates divine power. In each case, the second element is more extreme, sorry for the typo, or more forceful than uh, the first. So four pairs of words. The first word is the, the reality of the clay jarness that, that Paul experiences. It's pretty rough. And then the second word being the word describing uh, and, and yet, and, and, and yet here's, here's what God makes possible because of the treasure that I carry within the clay jar. So the first first pair, depending on how you translate it here, um, hard pressed and crushed, hard pressed and crushed. Uh, verse eight in the NRSV, afflicted, but not crushed, afflicted, but not crushed. So the first word, afflicted in the NRSV, hard pressed in the commentary, means to cause something to be constricted or narrow, to crowd, to cause to be troubled, oppressed, afflicted. So Deal suggests the image of a wrestler crushing the opponent in a in a headlock. You know, I mean, that's a pretty dire situation there. That's not a situation that you, you want to be in. Crushed, hard pressed, hemmed in, you know, things. Um, uh, you think of that scene in, in Star Wars where they, they jump into the garbage bin on the, yeah. on the Death Star, right? And all of a sudden the, the walls start, you know, coming in there, they're being hard pressed, yeah. right? That's, that's probably what Paul was thinking of there. Um, and yet not crushed. Paul never felt himself being crushed or restrained. Even in crushing circumstances, Paul found that he always had an escape. So being a clay jar means that sometimes we're we're hard pressed, we're we're afflicted. We feel things coming in on us, and yet somehow, you know, R two D two always stops the walls before they they come all the way and smash us. We're we're not crushed. We're not crushed. The second pair of words, uh, perplexed perplexed and despair. So the NRSV translates it that way, perplexed, but not driven, driven to despair. Perplexed, number 12, is perplexity or anxiety. That's kind of an interesting uh, twist on it. Perplexity or anxiety from a verb that denotes to be in a confused state of mind, to be at a loss, to be in doubt, to have uncertainty. So that, you know, that feels a little less like physical and more emotional or spiritual that because we are clay jars, we, we have experiences in our lives where we're at a loss. Um, we have, we're filled with doubt. We're perplexed. Even so, Paul says he was, he was not in despair. Again, he uses the word that is used elsewhere, chapter one, verse eight. Um, he's used an interesting pair of words to describe a state of mind. If the first word is to be at a loss or uncertain, the second word implies an advanced state of completely having no hope. While the second word is more intense than the first, it's rather difficult to ac accurately express this pair in English. Harris, another commentator, points out that Paul is using a play on words here, uh, like to be at a total loss, but not lost. To be at a total loss, but not not loss. And I, I like the idea of, of hope there to be to to have despair, to be at a loss, to uh, have high anxiety, to be in doubt, and, and yet to not completely be uh, uh, free from hope. There's still somehow there's a little spark of hope remaining. And, and that's what because of the treasure within the clay jar. The third third pair, number 13 here, persecuted. So uh, verse nine, persecuted, but not forsaken or abandoned, persecuted and forsaken or abandoned. Persecuted is used to express harassment, especially because of one's beliefs. It can imply aggravation to the point of death. 
The other word in this pair is abandoned, abandoned or forsaken. It's a compound word derived from a root word that implies to leave something behind, to leave something behind. Uh, this is the word that's used in the Greek Old Testament uh, reference of Deuteronomy 31. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, forsake you. So be persecuted, really to have people around you that are against whatever it is that you're standing for. And, and yet in spite of that, you're not alone. You're not forsaken, especially by God, right? And then the last, uh, last pair in verse nine, struck down but not destroyed, struck down but not perishing, the end of verse nine. The last two words have a broad range of meaning. This is number 14 on page 16, making it difficult to limit each term to one particular kind of difficulty. Struck down or cast down means to strike with sufficient force so as to note, uh, to, to bow down as it should be, to, or thrown down. In the passive form, it implies the blow of someone else on the victim to, to be hit by someone else. While Paul may have been knocked down, he was not permanently destroyed. Uh, so he uses the word perishing or knocked down, which implies to cause or experience destruction, to perish, uh, to ruin. During his life and ministry, Paul may have been knocked to the ground, but he was not permanently grounded. Um, or uh, uh, one translation puts it to, to, to be knocked down, but not knocked out. Mm -hmm. Knocked down, but not knocked out. So just look back over those those four pairs of words in verses eight and nine. Which of those means the most to you? Which sort of resonate with, with you and why? <clears throat> Adele? Uh, reflects the mind of the spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I find that over the course of my life, basically my walk with Jesus, I can be more and more perplexed and less and less mm -hmm. I mean, the things I don't know, you know, the uncertainty um, <clears throat> creates no anxiety. Mm. And it's saying things are too wonderful for me, and it's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So per perplexity doesn't have to be a, a bad place to live. Anxiety, which maybe yeah. is where it needs to be both. I don't know. Mm. But, but, uh, but I could also say perplexed, but not, not anxious about my perplexity. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Thank you. Anyone else? Which of those sort of resonate with you, Anna? That was what I was going to say, but kind of um, to add a little bit to what Dale said, and this is just for me, myself, um, discussions of things that were happening here. Um, I mean, I grew up in the mainline Church of Christ, and my mother was very upset and disturbed by the fact that mm -hmm. I was asked to leave singing, and we discussed all the scriptures that um address that and all the studies we've gone through and and you know she listened and she nodded and then she said but aren't you afraid you're going to go to hell so just kind of for me to let that all go mm -hmm. and say you know maybe that's not for me to fully understand and that's not my job that's up to god and because God is there and God is in charge or the center or in control, whatever you want to say, I don't have to be. I don't have to understand mm -hmm. everything. I don't have to decide about things like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of, for me, that's very free. Yeah. You know, I don't, maybe I don't know for sure. I know what I think, but that's up to God and, mm -hmm. and that's great. Yeah, thank you. I love that. Anybody else? These four words, which of them, which 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 of these four pairs resonate? Julie? I 
think the hard press you know, on every side and not mm. try to it's like, you know, what's the kind of really our hard press? It's hard to believe it's a statement of question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's just encouraging to know that, yeah, mm -hmm. that is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very comforting. All those walls <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, uh, Morgan. Yeah, I, I also keep thinking about like the audience who this would have been read to at first, a really like small group of people who are who are actually being persecuted by the government. Yeah. The Roman people uh, who, who are being told, you know, who are being afflicted, being perplexed, being persecuted, being struck down like physically and emotionally and spiritually, and how it would feel to to hear this. Mm -hmm. to, um, and it's so it's a it's validating in that all of those things are happening. It's not trying to disregard that experience, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's, it's also a message of encouragement in the midst of that, which I think is is really powerful. Yeah. Especially coming from someone who's a leader in this space, he's not trying to say like you guys are fine, keep going. He's like no, no, times are really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, you know, yeah. that, that and yet is really is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely not health and wealth, right? You know, like the first set of each of the four pairs is never going to happen to you. He's he's brutally honest because we're clay jars, even followers of Jesus can experience these things or particularly followers of Jesus can experience these things. So it's not it's not uh, uh, health and wealth and it's not toxic positivity. Oh, you're going to be okay. You know, it's, it's not that bad. Um, it's very realistic. And there, there's there's there is a reality of the treasure within us working itself out in uh hopeful comforting ways and and that's a great great takeaway okay we just have a few minutes left so let's just barely touch on the the last part of this text um you know uh, verses 10 and following so so basically what paul does now is he takes this idea of clay jarness that he's just illustrated in four ways. And now uh, he, he thinks of it particularly in terms of his relationship with the Corinthians, he and, and those uh, uh, with him who, who have been serving the Christians in and around Corinth. Um, so when, when he says, always carrying around in the body, the death of Jesus in verse 10 and verse 11, when he says, for we who are living are always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake. And when he says in verse 12, so death is at work in us. That's that, that's all just different ways of Paul saying what he just said. That even in this ministry to you, Corinthians, we, we are experiencing our, our clay jarness. And, and as we do... We, we feel alignment with the experience of Jesus, that he even, even Jesus carried his treasure in a clay jar and he suffered and died. And, and we too are experiencing suffering and dying. And so that's, that's what he's doing there. But, but now, you know, you, you might expect him at this point to then say, and the same thing is true for you, Corinthians. You, you too are experiencing dying and death, just like Jesus does. But instead, he, he says that, that our, uh, because of what we're suffering as clay jars, it is for your benefit. It, you, you are benefiting. You're experiencing life because of our death or our dying. We're always carrying around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our body. So this treasure is, is coming to life. And as a result, for we who are living are always being handed over to death so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So it, he's ultimately trying to say that what we're experiencing and the affliction, the perplex, perplexity, the persecution, the being struck down is all for your benefit. That life is flourishing because of our own dying and you yourselves you yourselves are experiencing that life because of this ministry so it, it feels like a little nod back to a couple chapters back where paul was saying you yourselves are our letter of recommendation 
right? Their, their own experience of life in Christ affirms the validity of Paul's ministry to them. And same thing's true here. The, the dying and suffering that they're experiencing is resulting in life on behalf of the Corinthians. Okay, we got to stop there um, so we can pray, and then we'll have time to pick up. So, um, Dale, could you lead us in prayer? Our God, of scholarship and love and grace and generosity, we come to you with our individual uh, concerns, our friends' concerns, and that is because his brother and his ongoing issues, uh, our own concern for the friends' spirits and the tension uh, in that uh, family. Uh, Intention in many families, uh, and the challenge that comes from that, that they, they each know that they are not alone, that there are people who care, and uh, there are answers in the realm of the spirit. We uh, pray for Kathy Kazansky, who is Kathy sister in law, Betty. Uh, that she will be helped and uh, you know, we have a concern for uh, the whole Bohannon plan which Judy lingers on uh, and uh, and we have to turn over matters of life and death to you and we do not really have the answer but, uh, but when the moment comes to give Judy the grace and peace to let go and to fully trust and even look forward into entering forward with you and be with the rest of the family as they uh, struggle with this. Be with the people in Ukraine who are suffering under the violence of the uh, of tyrannical leadership, of uh, leadership poisoned by nymphs of grandeur, spare our world from uh, uh, such pathology and from such men. We're thankful that Morgan and Easton with us today. We ask you to bless Morgan uh, as she brings us and your word uh, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Guy and Dimas, it's good to see both of you this morning. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't be because I'm coughing. I didn't want to be around you guys. Okay. Thank you, Guy. All right. Thank you.